So this is an update to the video I posted a couple weeks ago about the trapped knight problem. Again, the way this problem works, you have a knight on an infinitely big chessboard who is allowed to move to any square that he has not visited before, that he can visit using the knight's rules for moving. And he continues to work his way around the board until he gets trapped. He's not allowed to go back to the same square. And each time he has to go to the square of the lowest number that he can go to. And one of the questions that comes up is what happens if you adjust the knight's movement? So standard rule is for the knight to move one square in one direction and two squares in another direction. But you can imagine changing that up for the knight. So what I've done here, I've taken my previous code that I showed you on the previous video, and I've wrapped it in two while loops. So we're gonna loop over these two movement amounts, D1 and D2. Um, so D1, D1 is gonna start out at two, it'll increase by one each time. And then D2 will uh, start out one greater than D1, because there's no point in having them be equal to each other. Um, and then that'll increase up above uh, uh, D1, D1 by one step each time. Um, and you can see over here, we're already getting a little bit different shape than we had before, because this is the two, three case where the knight can move two steps in one direction and three steps in the other direction. And actually, I remember now that I needed to change. Yeah, 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 I do have the interval equal to one. Okay, good. I always pointed out on Twitter that um, this is not tracing out the entire trajectory unless you put this interval equals one. Uh, so thank you to uh, Twitter uh, conversation for uh, pointing that out. But you can see you're getting a different shape here because it's following this pattern of two comma three instead of one comma two. And it's gonna keep repeating itself, um, adjusting D1 and D2 each time. Now we're only going to run it if the two numbers don't have any common factors. So for example, if you run this and you do one step in one direction and two steps in the other direction, and then you do two steps in one direction and four steps in the other direction, you actually get the same number of moves because it follows the same pattern because it's essentially gonna ignore half of the board and it'll follow the same pattern just kind of rescaled based on the, uh, based on the scaling of the two uh, steps there. So we're only going to run each scenario if there's no common factor. So up above I've got a, um, I've got a function that will check for whether D1 and D2 have any common factors. And so we're only gonna go if there are no common factors. And of course, since this is a bit more intensive than the last code, we're doing this over and over again, um, I've set up an option where you can turn off the visual. So if you change this visual to visual equals false, um, it won't run this animation over here. And that lets it go a little bit faster. I actually downloaded this code to my desktop and ran it um, on the desktop itself rather than on the Trinket server just to get the fastest possible speed out of it. But basically at the end of each of these combinations, it will, again, it checks for whether it's trapped and then it will print for you three pieces of information. It'll show you the ratio D1, D2 to D1, because that's really the only piece of information that matters is the ratio of the two. Because again, if they have a common factor, it's the same number of steps to get trapped. Then it'll show the number of steps that it took to get trapped, and it will show you the square number on which it got trapped. I don't know that there's anything significant about that square number, but we'll check on that in just a minute. So I've let this run for the past week, gotten all kinds of interesting patterns like this little uh, squarish looking fish over here. And I've got my results collected over here in Excel. Here is the ratio D2 over D1. So the first few are pretty easy. It's, it's two in one direction and one in the other, three to one, four to one, five to one. Then you get over here and it's a little more complicated. It's like this is three to two, five to two, seven to two. Here we've got, okay, one and one third is four to three, five to three, seven to three, etc. And so here I've got a graph of the number of moves that it takes to trap the knight versus the ratio D2 over D1. And as you can imagine, the number of moves required to trap the knight increases as you uh, increase this ratio D2 over D1 because you're allowing it more freedom of movement as you increase this ratio. But it doesn't increase entirely steadily. So one thing I've noticed, you've got these little dips down here where it goes to, to some of this lower point. Some of the lowest points on this graph are integer values, so six, five, four, 
three, and I think this one is two. No, that's two thirds, two. Um, so the, the integers make up some of the lowest points on this graph, but they don't make up the only low point. So here you've got five thirds, you've got a ratio of, of five to three, and that's an even lower point than two to one is. Um, and then you'll have something like this one over here. You have three and a half is another dip. And then 3.7 jumps right back up. So going from 3.5 to 3.7 is a pretty big jump. Coming down from three and a third to 3.5 is a pretty big jump. So this thing kind of goes up and down oscillating. I'm not sure if it would be better to graph this in 3D of having the moves to trap versus D2 and D1 instead of just their ratio. But the thing is going to repeat anytime you have a common ratio. So that's interesting. But anyway, I thought this was pretty interesting. I fit it with a power law here. Um, it's an R squared of only 0.65, so it's not the best fit in the world, but it is slightly better than a uh, than an exponential graph. Exponential graph is 0.5 something. Um, I haven't yet tried making a graph of the square it's trapped on versus the ratio. Um, I suspect this is not going to yield a whole lot more interesting insight. Um, yeah, this is what the square trapped on, the number of square trapped on looks like. Let's change this thing to a log scale. Uh, let's come over to this one. Axis options, logarithmic scale, there we go. Yeah, I mean, it's not, I don't know that that's any better correlated than the first one. Let's just try adding a trend line. Um, it, yes, it's obviously not linear. Let's try the power law with this one. Um, let's see, display the equation, the R squared. You get a little bit better R squared value, uh, but not much. It's still not a good R squared value. I wouldn't let students get away with that in lab. Um, let's see. Let's go back to the fit here. Let's try a let's try an exponential 0.67. Yeah, the power law seems to be the winner here as well, although not a not a good winner, just kind of the winner by default. Uh, let's see. Let's change this axis to log as well. There we go. Just so that the power law is a straight line. So that's interesting, and it's, I imagine it'll follow the same kind of pattern here, where if you get an integer, it's one of the lowest ones. There's five, there's four, there's three. Yeah, so it, it makes sense that these two are going to be correlated with each other. Well, I hadn't thought about that before. If I graph these two versus each other, what will that end up looking like? Okay, so that's pretty interesting. That You would expect those to be pretty well correlated with each other, the, the square that you're trapped on versus the number of moves it takes to trap the knight. So anyway, I think this is a pretty interesting result. I've got more of this running uh, to try to fill in some of these gaps. So like, for example, what happens in between this 3 and 3.1? If I could get a 3.01, is it is it going to jump? Is it going to fill in this gap or is it going to strictly jump up? Is there some kind of asymptote in that? Anyway, it's definitely an interesting problem. It's definitely captured my attention and imagination. Um, that code will be available uh, at a link in the description below uh, so that you can check that out. Another fun variation I tried out. I've tried one that creates two trapped knights. So let me get this one up full screen for you. So this code, which I'll again make available in the description below, creates a red knight and a black knight. And we're going to use the standard. Uh, we're going to use the standard knight movement rules one and two. And basically, these two knights are going to share a common list of places they cannot visit. So when you run this, red and black are going to be moving uh, in parallel with each other, and neither of them is allowed to visit the square uh, that the other one uh, that the other one has visited. And you can see they kind of chase each other around the board. Um, it's a pretty fun thing to watch. So it definitely produces an interesting animation. Um, I'll let you use this code at the link in the description below to see what the answer is. You can also play around with their D2 and D1 to see what kind of combinations you can come up with. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.